People often become fascinated with mythical creatures and impossible fictional monsters from other planets. But many people forget these monsters already exist below us. This is a massive 7 inch mascara bird eater tarantula. And the name is not an exaggeration. This monster can easily take down birds, rodents, and reptiles. But we have a problem. This monster needs an ecosystem. You see, people have feared tarantulas for centuries and likely since the beginning of human existence. The first official human tarantula interactions were in 1370 in a small town in southern Italy. After a disease broke out in the town, people became frantic and hopelessly blamed nearby creatures for the disease. It started with the peasants, working long hours in the grass fields. After being bit, they would wildly jump and dance in fields to exhaust themselves, which they believed would help them survive the ferocious tarantula bite. It is now assumed the real culprit was rather a black widow spider and not a tarantula. History is filled with old beliefs and myths, one being inspired by tarantulas and spiders is that the world was created by Chuatamake, the earth prophet. In this legend, Chuatamake takes the form of a spider and spins a huge web across space, creating earth in the process. He then changes form to a butterfly, and as the butterfly flies down to earth, it creates mankind. But back to this massive bird eater tarantula standing right in front of us. This massive female is five years old and will soon reach her max leg span of over seven inches. Similar to other insects and spiders, female tarantulas are much larger and live much longer than males. This female can live over 20 years while male counterparts have beautiful purple colors but will only live around five years. It is believed that females are much larger and much stronger because it actually requires so much more energy and strength to produce and carry viable tarantula eggs. But now it's time to make a home for this female. The goal is to mirror the lush, dense jungle floors of Ecuador. Now that we have our tank emptied out and ready to go, the last step is to clean the glass. I first spray down the glass with a vinegar water solution and then spray it again after with a water solution. This is harmless to the animal inside and does a great job at cleaning stains off the glass, especially mineral deposits from old water spraying. Because of the humidity requirement of this species, we start with a drainage layer that will stop plants from being overwatered and stop the substrate from flooding. After putting a mesh divider on top of the drainage layer, we put the most important part of the ecosystem, the substrate. The substrate that I'm using is a mix of topsoil, cocoa fiber, and sphagnum moss. It will be home to hundreds of critters and will have to keep life thriving in this ecosystem. Next, we have to build a secure cave for tarantula. Something secure that can withstand the erosion of rainfall while protecting the tarantula from unwanted light, water, or predators, especially when she is vulnerable during molting. I had this dried driftwood root system that I had left over, so I tried to fit it in the tank, but I later brought it out because it didn't fit with the whole feel of this ecosystem. Now, it's time to bring the tank alive with plants. Tarantulas are strictly carnivores, so we don't have to worry about the bird eater consuming plant matter, but it's always good to know the plants you're using. As I mentioned, this mascara bird eater is found in Ecuador, where some of the oldest trees in the world are found. We're going to be using a ficus tree that will resemble one of these ancient trees that will tower over the critters below, often with tarantulas living near the roots. After adding in a creeping fig and some other tropical plants, it's now time to add in our green moss. 
If this ecosystem is truly successful, we hope to have a symbiotic relationship form between different plants, fungi, and mosses. As fungi can actually assist mosses and plants in growing and gathering nutrients. Next is to add in our leaf litter. This can't resemble a jungle floor ecosystem without fallen leaves. Imagine these leaves have served the older trees for years to eventually fall to the ground and be consumed by detritivores. That brings us to our final addition, the detritivores, or better known as decomposers. These creatures can range from springtails, isopods, to superworms, and more. And I know what you're thinking, won't the tarantula prey on these decomposers? This is possible, but if they're smart, they'll stay hidden below the leaf litter and below ground level. But inevitably, they will need to come to the surface periodically to find food and water. The job of these creatures is subtle, but very important. They will break down old plant and animal matter and return the nitrogen into the substrate for the plants to then use. Now that our ecosystem is in place, there's only one more thing to do. To add the apex predator that the environment was built for. With most new world tarantulas, this would be a fairly easy process. But this female is more aggressive, and rather than kicking her defense hairs, she displays a threat posture, revealing her massive fangs in the air. If there was ever a time she would bite, it's now. I slowly maneuver her into her enclosure, but she holds her ground as you can see. We slowly maneuver her and eventually she gives up and decides to turn and move into her new home. Understandably, she's confused because this is a new environment but she begins to explore. Three days later, the enclosure looks very different, but she's definitely settled in. As you can see, She's bulldozed much of the substrate, burying the leaf litter and destroying some of the plants. But most of the plants remain intact and that's the most important part. Not to mention the detritivores have went deep into the substrate and began their biological process. One effective detritivore we haven't added yet is the dubia roach. These insects are giant cleaning machines, eating fruits, animal, and plant matter, which makes them perfect for a planted ecosystem, living in small crevices and easily burying themselves. However, unlike springtails or isopods, these creatures are remarkably bigger, which makes them more susceptible to being hunted by tarantulas. As night approaches, the tank comes alive, with detritivores coming to the surface to find potential food. Superworms and dubia roaches make their way to the ground level, looking for easy meals. However, this dubia roach begins to wander too close to the apex predator, unknowingly. The roach moves closer and closer and just like that is grabbed by the bird eater tarantula. The brutal eating process begins. While the dubia roach is still alive and struggling, the tarantula sinks her fangs deep into the dubia roach. Unfortunately for the roach, dubia roaches can endure severe pain in crushing to survive, but here there's no escape. She begins crushing the dubia roach's tough exoskeleton with her fangs. After the fangs have finally sinked in, the tarantula begins to pump venom into the prey. This flesh-eating venom is filled with enzymes that immediately begin to break down the dubia roach's insides. The dubia can do nothing but struggle as it turns into liquid, like something out of a science fiction horror movie. After the venom process is complete, the tarantula begins to ingest the roach liquid insides back through her fangs, 
leaving nothing but a shell-like carcass behind. As brutal as this process may seem, it's an integral part of a tarantula's life. After discarding of the roach carcass, she retreats back to her cave, sure not to bring the old Dubia roach body in as it may attract unwanted pests. Hours later, she can be seen carefully cleaning her fangs and legs. It's really important to avoid possible parasitic mites. The rest of the detritivores continue on, safe for now, but unknowing of the dangers that lie ahead.